So great, it's two o'clock. Um, welcome, everyone. So my name is Natalia Galanina, and we officially begin. Uh, welcome online, everyone, to our annual Macmillan Online Conference. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I know it's late in some parts of Russia, and I really ap appreciate that you could join us. Uh, we're really excited to see so many people from different areas of Russia. And you see, if you see the list, um, we have people from different cities here. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes. Um, there is a, um, a chat where you can ask questions. And if the speakers have time, they, they, they will be able to answer your questions. So please do um, chat communicate, ask questions. As always, this conference is being recorded, and um, later this week, uh, you'll be sent, uh, the link will be sent to you, and also the link will appear in the chat box to download the certificates, to um, activate and download it, and I'll show how to do it a bit later, as I see many questions about the certificates. Well, uh, today we'll be talking about so this is the certificate you'll get. And today we'll be talking about um, co the course book, which um, is and has been very popular all over the world, especially in Brazil before the World Cup uh, encounters. And Susan Holden, the author of the book, will be talking about it. Then um, uh, Marina Kladova and Natalia Moiseva will share their experience um, on working with uh, In Company 3.0. Then uh, the author of Open Mind, uh, Steve Taylor Knowles, uh, will talk about the writing sections, um, about writing sections in Open Mind. Then um, I want to draw your attention to the special authors from our distributors. Um, if you live uh, in Moscow or in any places, there are distributors where you can purchase our books and as well as uh, in a major online um, shop, which is called azon.ru, where you can order three books and buy the fourth one for only one ruble. So we officially begin, and um, I want to introduce uh, the first speaker of today's con conference. It's uh, Susan Holden. Susan is uh, the author of um, the course book, which is called Encounters, Encounters English Here and Now. And uh, Susan will be talking about the communication in real life. So, Susan, over to you. Hello. There. Hello. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Hello. There. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes, Susan, we can hear you, but press twice, start sharing your video, your webcam, please. I thought I'd done that. Oh, yes. I thought I'd done that. Oh, yes. Yeah, That's now we can hear you. Good. And see you, okay. yeah. Right. It's very nice to be here talking to you. I'm sitting at home in Scotland, um, and it's very strange to be talking halfway across the world. But anyway, it's very good to be here. And as Natalia said, I'm the author of Encounters. Um, which is a course that we produce specifically for adult learners. And I know that teaching adults is actually quite different from teaching in a school situation. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the problems of teaching adults, the things I, I started thinking about when I was preparing the course, and specifically um, how we help, help adults where they have to use speaking in everyday life. So we're talking about um, communicating in real life situations, we're talking about adult learners, and we're talking about the kind of situations in which they might need to use English. And there are certain problems, I think. So we're going to ask what on earth can we do to help our learners and help ourselves as teachers? Because sometimes as a teacher, teaching adults, you have different problems from those you have when you're teaching in a school situation. And in fact, it's different from when you learnt English, probably in a much more organised situation. 
So I want to look at the problems and hopefully in 20 minutes um, or maybe 18 minutes now, come up with some solutions. So it's based on what I found when I was doing the research for encounters, looking at adult learners, thinking of the situations in which they were going to um, learn English, speak English, use English and ask the big question, what can we do? So adult learners. I had to think, what is their motivation? Why are they learning English? What are their objectives? What do they want to get out of it? And what problems do they have? And as I put these screens up, if, if you can think of any answers to those things, those questions, based on your own experience, it would be very useful if you can type them into the chat. I shall have to put my glasses on to, to, to see them. So what are the problems with, with, for adults? Why are they learning English, a foreign language? What do they want to achieve? And what's difficult for them? And what about your students? What, what problems do they have? Lack of time, yes, yes, yes. Adults don't have enough time. In, in, in school, students are working and learning within a controlled environment. The problem for adults is they have to fit it in with everyday life. I'm going to go on, but I'm, I'm going to be really interested to see what you type afterwards. The things I came up with when I was doing the research was lack of self-confidence. As adults, we're quite nervous, I think, about learning something new. Lack of time, as you've said. The feeling that English is difficult. Maybe all foreign languages are difficult, but English seems to present a lot of problems. Um, some adults have the memories of learning at school and learning English at school or a foreign language at school probably meant learning grammar, learning vocabulary, doing a lot of writing, maybe a little bit of reading and passing an exam. And that's really a bit different from using English, a foreign language in everyday life. And then the pressure, lack of time, the fact that maybe they've got a job, maybe they're having to fit it in with the family. Um, all this uh, creates more pressure on them. So what can we do? Well, I then went to the other end. I thought about the learners, your students, and then I thought about the situations in which most adults might learn, might use English. And I had to think about what type of a situation, where, what other people would be involved, what is the objective of the situation, and what language skills would be involved. And I came up with and observed a lot of communication going on in situations like this, reception desks in hotels or in big offices, where a foreigner, a visitor, is communicating with a local person. So the local person is behind the reception desk or answering the hotel phone and the foreigner is asking for something, wanting to have something done and is communicating with the local person who is very often in a business or work situation. And a lot of communication is done on the phone. And of course, the problem with phones is that you can't see the other person unless you're working on you, you're, you're talking on a, a on a smartphone. And, you know, um, people's expressions when you can see them can be quite reassuring. But if you hear somebody being angry on the phone in a foreign language, that can cause a lot of problems. So those were the, the, the kind of situations I thought of. And the challenges for the learner seem to be understanding, communicating and anything that their job would require of them. And the understanding problems include the type of English. Now, I speak British English. I speak relatively slowly. I use quite a lot of pauses, um, but a lot of people are going to be uh, communicating not only in one type of native speaker English, but in Japanese English, Brazilian English, Italian English. And this is something that your students have to be prepared to, to understand, communicate with, and also have the, the, um, the ability and the confidence to say, I I'm sorry, could you repeat that? What did you say? 
So accent delivery, personal rapport in speaking is, is important. I think we all know that if you like the person you're talking to, who is talking to you, you're relaxed and you can understand more and the English you produce, the language you produce, will be much more relaxed. So the personal rapport, lack of stress and cultural behaviour, because different nationalities, different cultures behave in different ways. Some of us, some people are very formal. Some people go immediately in with what they want to find out. Some people can sound quite rude. And for an adult in a real life situation, that's actually quite difficult. So what do we do? And I'm just checking the time. OK, so the problems I came up with in my research were the feeling that speaking is so difficult. Um, the relationship specifically with English um, between the written text and the spoken forms. Now, I'm an Italian speaker and um, I'm lucky because because Italian is written down in the way that it's spoken. I can actually read aloud a text in Italian, even if I don't understand the words. Um, an Italian might um, argue with that. But um, the problem with English, as you know, is that the, the spoken version and the written version are very diff different. And for adults who've been brought up on written text, reading written text in grammar, grammar, vocabulary books and so on, this, this is a sort of psychological problem. Pronunciation is, is um, uh, contributes to the lack of self-confidence. The feeling of what if I don't understand? Help, help, help. I mean, in school, you just don't get a good mark in the exam. In real life, it can matter more. So I decided that the, the, the way to really help our adult learners was to concentrate on listening and speaking in real life situations. And that's what I'm going to do for the next 10 minutes. Now, the obvious thing to do was to say, OK, the course book needs to have a lot of dialogues. And here's a dialogue, a pretty typical dialogue. Um, it's the, 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 the topic is giving and responding to complaints. In most textbooks, that would be accompanied by a photograph. There might be a focus question. There might be comprehension questions afterwards. That's in a sort of school textbook. But for adults, that's just a lot of words. There's no context. There's no idea who the people are. There's no idea why they're communicating. And adults, in order not to be put off and made to, to, to feel more nervous, are going to need some help. So what I decided was that in every lesson, there should be a very clear progression there should be input from the teacher, providing them with the language that they're going to, to um, use when they produce the language. There should be input and practice. There should be quite a lot of use of photos to contextualize where the conversation is taking place. And the use of photos can lead to speculation and discussion. Who are these people? What's the relationship between them? Do they like each other? Are they comfortable? Et cetera, et cetera. So talking about the photo helps to bring the eventual language to life. Then the idea was that having established who the people are, you listen to them talking. You listen to a dialogue, but you don't see it written down. And while you're listening, you, as the teacher, ask your students to focus on specific things, very, very specific things. Something quite simple is what does the person feel? What's the problem? What's the uh, what's the solution? Then they have a lot of practice in producing those dialogues and bits of those dialogues themselves, but led by the teacher rather than what's in the course book so that they're pr they're producing chunks of language, getting confident little bits of it, concentrating on intonation. And it's only after they've practiced the dialogue a lot of times that they actually focus on the full written form and can use it for role play. And what I found when I've, I've visited classes where students are, are actually using the material is that 
because they're doing the dialogue in a sense, producing it lots and lots of times, they do actually get much more self-confident than they would if they just read it aloud the first time round. And you can see students beginning to think, uh -huh, these are real people talking. I can get them to um, communicate in ways that reflect real life. So I could say to my students, for example, um, imagine that you're in a bad temper or imagine that you're in a hurry. How would this affect the dialogue? And because you're injecting sort of human um, uh, uh, human emotions, this brings the words to life. And what happens is that a lot of adults then start thinking more as people and less as students speaking a foreign language. So that we're working all the time in every lesson from input via photos, via a stimulus, via practice, to role play, and then to output. Let me show you what this looks like. Here, here in fact, um, are photos for two dialogues from lesson 20 of the elementary level. Um, there's one dialogue, the one on the left, where um, a phone conversation is going on, and all the students are asked to do is to focus on the problems, find out what the problem is, find out what one of the person, one of the people is requesting. In the other one, it's um, a, a dialogue in um, a hotel restaurant. Um, in fact, it's one that I overheard when I when I was researching the course. I spent a lot of time uh, listening to people, looking at people, writing down, making notes, looking at their body language and the way they they, they moved. Um, and uh, th this is is a real life situation, not with these people. Um, there were two people in a hotel restaurant. They'd been waiting ages to order. The restaurant was very very busy. They were getting crosser and crosser, angrier and angrier. And um, the poor waiter uh, who came was very apologetic. So that the, the, the task for the students in this case is to focus on what is being said, but just find out what is the apology and what suggestion is made. So something quite, quite simple, but using the photos to, um, uh, to focus on the language context. And for those of you using Encounters, you know that every lesson looks exactly the same. Well, I, I, I mean, the layout is the same. Um, it begins with um, a, a very clear focus on what the, the learners are going to be doing during the lesson. They have some practice based on the previous lesson. They then have on the left hand page the uh, photo for the dialogue, which they're going to hear. They get the dialogue written on the right hand page and my suggestion is that they don't look at the text until they have actually produced language in a controlled way with you the teacher first and then they go on to reinforce what they've done with a little bit of consolidation practice so as i said it's a progression and i think i've got about four more minutes um, it's a progression from input to output so Looking at a, a, a lesson in a little bit more detail, the teacher's notes are very, very important. I know as a teacher, there's a temptation not to use the teacher's book, but the teacher's notes here, because um, because Encounters is a bit different from a lot of other courses, I, I do stress that you do look at the teacher's notes. And there are ideas for presenting the language here before they actually see the written dialogue. So the, the, the whole point is to build up their self-confidence by giving them practice in choosing a location where foreign visitors might go, for example, a restaurant, a hotel, a public place, and think of a possible problem for each one. And what you're doing there is using the adult's knowledge of their own environment. You're taking them mentally out of the classroom, away from English, into the real world, and you're using that to get them to produce little bits of language for practice. And on the audio, in fact, they will hear examples of um, this kind of language, which you can use to uh, encourage them to repeat and use for pronunciation practice. And I've concentrated a lot on intonation and stress. 
because for me in communication, that's the most important thing. Um, this, in fact, is the page for this particular lesson and the other page. And in the teacher's notes, as I said, you get a lot of very detailed information as to what to do as you use the dialogue, as you use it again, as you use it again. On the audio, you'll find that there are versions of the dialogue where there are gaps for them to repeat the local person and there are other gaps to repeat the other person. And they can act out the conversation having practiced it several times. And that, in fact, is the conversation that they use to role play. And you can encourage them to be as bad tempered, as apologetic, um, changed details, really bring the, the, the um, dialogue to life. And of course, the lesson isn't only about speaking. Um, it's own, not only about listening and speaking. It's also about putting, putting this into a context. So what is important is that after they've produced all the language, you give them the chance to see what they've been um, doing, that they can have a record of it. And also a, a, an idea to use the fact that adults are living and working in a world outside the classroom, get them to link what they do in the classroom with the real world. So get them to think about what foreign visitors often complain about. What problems do they sometimes have? and get suggest to the students that they could bring these to the next lesson. And that means that all the time you're building up a link between what you do in the classroom, what the adults do in their own lives, and how you can put it together. Now, I'm going to stop there. It's not quite as much as I was going to do, but I, I, I think I've thrown out a lot of ideas and you, you've uh, been typing in some wonderful um, ideas as I've been talking, which I'm now going to. Susan, the question is about the levels. And it's been very good talking to you, and I, I look forward to reading all your comments. And I hope some of you are enjoying using encounters. And Natalia knows that if anybody has any problems with encounters, I'm always happy to ask questions via email. So enjoy the rest of your afternoon evening. Bye bye. Thank you very much, Susan. So the question was about the level. Bye. 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 Thank you, Susan. Bye. -bye. So some of the questions were about the level. In here in Russia, we have only two levels. It's um, probably elementary and pre-intermediate. Uh, so we've chosen only two levels for our country, um, I think which is suitable for, um, for learners to start to speak English in their own country, because this is um, not quite a usual book. It's uh, not about speaking English abroad. It's about speaking English here and now. Uh, for example, if um, your city will be hosting uh, the World Cup next year, probably it's the best book for you to um, for private lessons or for probably for group classes and um, you can help your adult students to start speaking at last. Well, uh, our next speaker, so um, we continue our conference and our next speaker is uh, Natalia Moiseva. Natalia Moiseva is, uh, uh, has been a um, Macmillan teacher for a long time. She used to live in Moscow, but now she lives in Prague and now she's a business coach. And Natalia will talk about her experience on working uh, on the, in Company 3.0 with um, students from all over the world. For example, um, now she's using it with Chinese students. So Natalia, over to you. Can you switch your webcam, Natalia? Hello? Uh, yes. Uh, OK. So I have switched my camera. Do, can you hear me well, colleagues? Can you hear me? Hello? Uh -huh. I, I, I think that, yes. 
Hello, can you hear me? Yes, very good, very good. Thank you very much. So first of all, let me greet my Macmillan colleagues because I'm really excited to be speaking today in such a great company. But please excuse me because I would like to continue my speech in Russian. The reason is that I would like to sound more personal and more appealing today to my Russian colleagues as I'm going and I want to share my own story. Yes, to share my own experience of becoming a business coach. So, дорогие коллеги, добрый день. Я продолжу на русском, потому что действительно сегодня у меня немножко необычное выступление. Я уверена, что многие сейчас из вас стоят перед выбором и мучаются сомнением, браться ли за такое новое направление своей деятельности, как бизнес-курсы. И я была в похожей ситуации, поэтому сегодня я бы хотела помочь вам разрешить ваши сомнения, помочь вам э, э, принять правильное решение э, и максимально открыто, максимально э, честно рассказать вам, как все происходит на самом деле, на практике. Э, ну, возможно, кто-то из вас... Давние друзья Макмиллан, может быть, помнят, что в прошлом году я тоже выступала на конференции Макмиллан и делилась своим опытом работы с маленькими детьми. На примере другого прекрасного издания Little Learning Stars, и действительно все шло прекрасно, я работала с маленькими детьми, но так случилось в моей жизни, что мы переехали с семьей в другой город, мы переехали в Прагу, и... Совершенно удивительно для меня оно оказалось, что курсы для маленьких детей совершенно не востребованы здесь, в той мере, в которой они востребованы в Москве. Зато очень востребованный сегмент – это работа со взрослыми. И не просто курсы английского, а курсы делового английского. Для меня это было совершенно новое направление, и я э, тоже испытывала большие сомнения, но в итоге я взялась. Э, и вот уже практически год я довольно успешно работаю со взрослыми, как в группах, так и индивидуально, э, в разных компаниях. Э, преподаю им бизнес английский, э, и как Наталья Ивановна уже упомянула, действительно, это люди разных национальностей, и чехи, и китайцы, и русские, в основном мы общаемся с ними на английском языке. И мы подготовили небольшое видео, так что у вас есть возможность немножечко подсмотреть, как все происходит на самом деле. Можно, пожалуйста, попросить первое видео включить? Спасибо. Well, okay, So please look at the board. Our today's theme is what women want. Yeah, actually it is devoted to advertising for women as a target group. Yes, and I've got some questions to ask here. So, do you think, Michaela, that um, some advertisement appeal more to men or women? Yeah? Yes. Okay, and why do you think so? to women more mm -hmm. and it is uh, for beauty, uh -huh. beauty uh, industry yeah. Yeah. okay and um, maybe uh -huh. um, for men are in the guise of uh, cars of and cars uh -huh. men are things yes some technical things yes okay And, um, well, Alita, do you think that women should be targeted in some special way? Yes, for example, let's take glasses because your company is specializing on glasses. And on the one hand, it is um, an essential thing for people with bad eyesight. But on the other uh, hand, it is a fashionable accessory, yes? yes? So do you think that it should be some kind of special advertisement for women? For yes. Glasses? I yeah. think so, yeah. because huh? uh, we, the men, uh, 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 more glasses more glass. than the men. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> you mean it. You mean it. Uh -huh. 
Да, ну вот вы увидели маленький кусочек. Как вы видите, тема данного урока ⁇ What women want ⁇ риторический вопрос, который мы в данном случае рассматриваем в контексте создания целевой рекламы для разных потребительских сегментов, в частности для женщин. Короче говоря, тема абсолютно далекая от, скажем так, жизненного и профессионального опыта учителя английского языка, не так ли? И на этот пример очень хорошо иллюстрирует первую проблему, с которой сталкиваются люди, которые хотят преподавать бизнес английский. И, честно говоря, это страх. Страх показаться непрофессиональным, некомпетентным, попросту не в теме. Да? Я ничего об этом не знаю, говорите вы себе. Так вот, давайте разбираться с этими страхами. На первый взгляд, вы действительно попадаете в такую уникальную для себя ситуацию, когда ваши студенты, люди, которые с бизнес-лексикой имеют дело каждый день, знают вроде бы больше вас. И берясь за эти бизнес-курсы, вы вроде как немножечко, создается такое впечатление, невольно заходите на другую территорию, на чужую территорию. Но я сразу хочу вас успокоить и отмести эти сомнения, потому что это впечатление ошибочное, оно совершенно иллюзорное. Потому что я вас уверяю, все понимают, что вы не эксперт по маркетингу, рекламе, вы эксперт по английскому языку. Именно для этого вас туда и позвали. Поэтому никто, ваши студенты не ожидают от вас проведения тренингов по продвижению какого-либо продукта или еще чего-нибудь такого бизнес все понимают что это лишь материал для отработки тех или иных речевых инструментов а речевые инструменты или навыки или skills они те же самые что и в любом другом курсе это наши хорошо знакомые reading writing speaking and listening и уж здесь то мы с вами знаем где развернуться не так ли коллеги Поэтому, таким образом, на нашей стороне здесь наш многолетний опыт работы по отработке вот этих языковых компетенций. И, конечно, это знание методологии. А методология тоже универсальна. Это, например, классический принцип, который называю принцип 3P – Presentation, Practice, Production. Прекрасный принцип, который представляет собой, дает нам четкую структуру, универсальную структуру урока, на которую можно нанизать любой контент, будь то занятие с маленькими детьми дошкольного возраста, либо бизнес английский. Давайте мы убедимся, что эта схема, этот принцип наш методологически работает и посмотрим следующее видео, пожалуйста. Ага, 
Да, коллеги, я надеюсь, меня сейчас слышно. Хорошо, я хотел бы ответить на некоторые вопросы по поводу вот данной группы. Да, по поводу количества человек я поговорю, раскрою секрет позже. Эта группа работников чешской компании Grand Optical, которая специализируется на оптике разного вида, это очки, солнечные очки и так далее. Люди все из разных совершенно отделов, люди из маркетинга, люди из отдела рекламы, люди из финансового отдела, то есть составная группа из разных разных специалистов, да, здесь представлена. И в данном случае вы видели этап урока, который называется Practice, где они отрабатывают на определенных упражнениях то, что было им презентовано в, на первой стадии. Ну так вот, я повторюсь, что действительно вы должны понимать, что на вас работает ваш, ваш многолетний опыт и на вас работает знание методологии. Так в чем же тогда состоит наш страх? Вот как вы думаете, дорогие, в чем заключается принципиальное отличие курса бизнеса английского от любого другого специализированного или общего языкового курса? В чем ваше мнение, как вы думаете? Жду ваших комментариев. Ага, да, совершенно верно, Кристина. Смотрите, э, да, да, Людмила, все верно, и Анна смотрит в корень. Это специальное наличие специальной бизнес-лексики, которую мы с вами, ну, можем и не владеть, да, в силу определенных причин. Профессия учителя, конечно, универсальная, но не настолько, да. Э, именно в этом и состоит корень нашего страха. Но я вас уверяю, что эта проблема решаема с помощью тщательной подготовки к уроку на основе хорошего, современного учебника, учебного пособия, которое содержит максимальную концентрацию вот этой живой бизнес-лексики и который разделен на э, хорошие тематические блоки, понятные. Вот для меня такой палочкой-выручалочкой является э, учебник In Company э, Macmillan которая буквально за ручку проведет вас по всем этим перипетиям бизнес-жизни и будете щелкать, как орехи, все эти э, термины product features и так далее, и так далее. Да? Давайте посмотрим следующий отрывочек, будьте добры. Следующее видео, пожалуйста, можно да, посмотреть? Да, большое спасибо. Это следующая э, стадия урока, которая называется Free Practice, то есть когда мы немножко ослабляем контроль, и э, наши э, дорогие ученики начинают уже более свободно обращаться с той лексикой, которая и грамматика, которую они выучили в начале. Э, так вот, э, да, мы, э, задали вопрос, э, как вы преподаете за границей, что вы заканчивали, что вам дает право э, это делать. Отвечу сразу, что существуют разные э, курсы, э, их можно заказать закончить по интернету, например, в моем случае это TESOL Certificate, то есть это сертификат, который квалифицирует вас как преподавателя международного уровня. Много организаций, самое известное это Trinity University, которые дает, проводят эти курсы, 
ну, это как курс повышения квалификации, можно сказать так, да, на международном уровне. Итак, я бы хотела немножко продолжить. Так вот, на мой взгляд, три ключа к успеху в преподавании бизнес-курсов, по крайней мере, к первому шагу, для того, чтобы сделать первый шаг к этому, это наш опыт по отработке языковых компетенций, которые универсальны везде, наша методология и знания этой методологии, которым мы обладаем, и наличие хорошего современного пособия, которым вот в данном, в моем случае, является in company. Но дальше происходит интересно. Дальше вы беретесь, решаетесь хорошо на этот курс, вы беретесь, приходите, подготовлены и так далее. И тут открываются разные моменты. Не назову их проблемами, но, скажем так, специфика работы со взрослыми вот в такой бизнес-среде. Раскрою вам секрет, был такой вопрос, сколько же человек в вашей группе? Я вам отвечу, там 6 человек. И я честно ждала два месяца, пыталась снять это видео, ожидая того прекрасного момента, когда вся группа соберется вместе. В общем, я его не дождалась. Как вы понимаете, на видео присутствует только три человека из этой группы. И, собственно говоря, я подумала, что на самом деле так и нужно показать, потому что это вот максимально честно раскрывает ту специфику, с которой вам придется столкнуться. А именно то, что всегда на уроках кто-то отсутствует. Поскольку это деловые люди, занятые, то э, кто-то всегда на бизнес-трипе, э, бизнес кто-то на встрече, у кого-то просто очень много работы, он не успевает. Поэтому всегда кого-то, кто-то будет отсутствовать. И для учителя, для преподавателя, который должен идти по какой-то определенной программе и всегда двигаться вперед, в общем-то, это есть большая проблема. Что с этим делать? И вот здесь я тоже нашла решение с помощью учебника In Company. Есть такая замечательная вещь, как Case Studies. То есть практические задания где можно применить полученные знания. Ну, например, вот в данном случае, в данном контексте создать свою собственную рекламу. То есть это такая пролонгированная, расширенная стадия production. Поэтому, то есть мы можем на первом уроке дать вот по обычной классической, классической схеме presentation, practice, production материал, а дальше на другом уроке повторить то же самое, но под другим углом зрения, уже представив им case study. Вот давайте создадим рекламу сами, да, рекламу для женщин. То есть те, кто не пришел на первое задание, получают возможность все это узнать и повторить, и проработать на втором задании во время case study. Те же, кто по счастливой случайности присутствовал на обоих занятиях, просто рассматривают данную проблему под другим углом, и им не кажется, что они потеряли время, пришли и узнали уже то же самое, что они уже знают. Да? Поэтому это прекрасная вещь, я ее очень люблю, и я попрошу сейчас включить четвертое видео, где мы уже видим один из примеров, как студентка сделала сама рекламу для женщин в данном случае. Пожалуйста, четвертое видео. So, Alitza, what product uh, did you choose? Uh, it is okay. So you're welcome. So we offer the best stage of the art product. Wind break jackets. It's the most favorite dress designed by Claudia Schiffer's new designer studio. Uh, there are a variety of styles and colors, and you can get it from size XS to 6XL. Uh, it is fashionable and also practical. And uh, you will buy three pieces. No. And if you will buy three pieces, you will get extra add-ons. Three presents are hiking trousers. You can climb Pamir Hill in it, and everyone will admire you. For one piece is price $100, and for three pieces also. Uh, so, <laughs> it's good value for money. The fabric is like a silk, but it is easy to clean. You can wash it, wash it, and again wash it. <laughs> For three first customers, we have other extra at once. It's beautiful 
refrigerator. <laughs> Don't wait for better offer. <laughs> well, let's say it was brilliant. You should be working in marketing branch for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Did you like it, Katka? Yeah. yeah very Да, ну вот мы увидели такой немножко забавный, посмеялись, да, прекрасная женщина, со знанием дела подошли к теме, приготовили прекрасную рекламу. Отвечая на вопросы, которые я вижу в чате, во-первых, уровень вот данных студентов это про мире это, то есть на самом деле довольно-таки, ну не сказать низкий, но еще и не профишент, конечно, да, поэтому мы видим, что язык действительно нуждается иногда в исправлении. Но что касается меня, например, в данном it depends, да, исправляли я ошибки был вопрос. Иногда я на стадии practice, я могу исправлять по ходу. На стадии production, конечно, я слушаю, записываю все ошибки, даю человеку возможность свободно высказать все, что он думает по этой теме, и в конце уже как a feedback, а feedback обязателен на каждом уроке, конечно, и они тоже хотят узнать, каков результат их работы, да. Конечно же, я уже исправляю ошибки в конце, ну или делаю некое поправление, да, то есть в качестве feedback. Обязательно всегда подчеркивая, что работа была проведена хорошо и так далее, и так далее. То есть кнут и пряник, как везде. Ну, дорогие коллеги, времени у нас остается мало. Я еще раз подчеркиваю, что вот у меня было сегодня такое, так, я поставила перед собой такую задачу, вдохновить вас, не бояться браться за эти бизнес-курсы, берите пособие хорошее и отнеситесь к этому как к курсам повышения квалификации. Вот действительно так. То есть я вам очень советую пройти самостоятельно вот это пособие in company хотя бы один раз с какой-то одной группой, и вы уже приобретете для себя действительно нам много новых знаний, и это откроет для вас новые перспективы. Моментов, вот про которые я говорила, их достаточно много, конечно, не только количество, количественный состав группы, специфика, она присутствует. Обо всем сейчас я рассказать не могу, но я очень открыта к общению, пожалуйста, задавайте вопросы, находите меня на Фейсбуке, либо LinkedIn, и я с удовольствием продолжу с вами дискуссию, отвечу, посоветую, все расскажу честно. Еще был вопрос интересный по поводу бизнес-коуча, ну, честно говоря, бизнес-коуч, конечно, это ничем принципиально от учителя, преподавателя не отличается, я воспринимаю это слово коуч как эксперт. Да, не бойтесь стать экспертами по бизнес-английскому. Я вам желаю большой удачи. Сейчас посмотрю еще быстренько чат, есть ли, есть ли у меня коллеги из Макмиллан, есть ли у меня возможность ответить на какие-то еще вопросы по времени. Да, спасибо, вам тоже спасибо. Спасибо, спасибо, да, за открытость и честность. Угу, отличного вам дня, вам тоже. У меня еще дальше продолжается занятие с китайской группой. Uh -huh. Yes, so thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Yes. yes. Спасибо большое, коллеги. Я также по возможности еще продолжу смотреть и участвовать в онлайн-конференции, послушаю своих коллег, с удовольствием поучусь. А вам успехов и вдохновения. Спасибо. Всего доброго. До свидания. Большое спасибо, Наташа. Наташа, хорошего продолжения рабочего дня. Now we continue our conference, and the next speaker is Marina Kladova. Marina is a teacherpreneur, and I know that this word was invented by Marina. Marina, am I right? Uh, and she's currently working at Chief Methodology Officer at Skyeng. She's a Delta Certificate teacher, working mostly with um, adults at B2B and ESP fields. She also hosts online Sky Teach conferences, and I was lucky to take part in it uh, last Saturday. And her sphere of interest is teacherpreneurship, ELT management, and uh, ed teach, ed tech. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So, Marina, over to you. Hello, can you see me? Can you hear me? Could you just confirm that you could hear me and that you could see me? All right, all right. So, hello everyone, and thank you, Natalia, for introducing me. 
uh, today I'm going to share my experience on um, how I teach business English with in company three. Point zero. No video. Can you see the video right now then? Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, today we are going to talk. I'm going to share some tips how I taught uh, business English to my learners uh, with in company elementary level. Uh, as Natalia has said, so I'm a Delta qualified teacher and teacher trainer, and currently I'm the chief methodology methodology officer at Skying. And um, but previously I worked a lot with uh, students, usually with top management and with company owners. So my main sphere of interest was uh, teaching ESP, I'm like English as a, English for specific purposes. And um, let me just sorry. Can you hear me better now? No better. It's strange. Natalia, I think I just need some. No, it's okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to show you my story and my experience on how to work with, uh, um, with business English and within company. So uh, every time when I start uh, teaching a new client or a new group, I usually make the portrait of my students. So who they are, what kind of interests they have, uh, what pain they have, what, are they, what their strong and weak points are, and... So when I started working with uh, in company, I draw the portrait that normally, so my students were usually top management, 40 plus. Uh, they usually have got some very negative experience in learning English. So they could speak English a bit while traveling, but uh, during the conversation with their business partners or on business trips, they experienced some difficulty in communicating they understood not so much and they felt really stressed because the position their position it was more a psychological barrier that their position was quite high but they were feeling like school children who couldn't produce a thing in english and um, moreover they had some soviet mindset on how to learn english so they they really wanted to focus only on grammar and uh, they wanted to do a lot of drilling, to do a lot of exercises, and then kind of stuff. So therefore, I had to work a lot to persuade them just to start a book, and they really like it. Um, so what I liked about in company is that uh, they have their starter and elementary levels, which is very rare for business English. Uh, besides, it is fully skills-based, and... There are a lot of listening and reading activities, as well as speaking and some practical tasks like case studies, presentation, writing emails, and others. Uh, I look through the content, and we have discussed and we discuss with my learners at the very beginning the topics which they like from the content page, and almost 95% of the topic were liked by my learners, and we decided to take the book elementary. Um, me as a teacher like the approach to the language presentation it was completely context-based presentation so all the vocabulary all the structures and grammar were presented in the text either in listening or in reading and they were practiced in text as well so no boring exercises like in disconnected sentences so all the practice was uh, in the text uh, in the whole text around the topic um, Today, I'd rather share, so of course, the work with in company was pretty standard. I mean, so there was a book, a student's book, a workbook, a teacher's book, 
but I have adapted some tasks and uh, I want to share a couple of ideas um, uh, which I came, came up across, uh, which I came up with. Uh, while working with this book. So first of all, we have a certain procedure how we work with word lists. Um, so uh, in the book, they are they are classified by units uh, in the alphabetic order. And because my learner was not, um, he was not, he had some basic knowledge and some of the words were very obvious. So we decided to mark all the, after each lesson, my student had to mark all the words with three colors, green, yellow, and red. So he marked the word green if he knows the words and if he uses the words in, in practice. He marked the words yellow if he kind of remembers, kind of remembered the words, but maybe uh, didn't use them actively in the speech. And the red were the words which he doesn't know at all. And uh, after each lesson, actually, we had got a set of the words which were given as homework to learn. And as it was the Google Doc online and my learners marked in real time, I could actually see the progress, how many words he knows, how many words he doesn't know, which words he doesn't know. And I started the next lesson with the words which he marked either yellow or red, and we paid special attention to these words. Um, yeah, it helped uh, to focus, like it kind of, um, it's kind of scaffold, uh, eliciting of what he knows, what he doesn't know. Um, just a kind of an idea, I use this traffic light approach to many things, to mistake correction, to the words, and many, many things, so you could just borrow this idea. So the next point which I want to share with you is the phrase bang. So this is uh, something uh, which you could find in online book. And uh, my learners usually write their own examples uh, in the phrase book. Um, sometimes there were the questions just to answer. And we also drilled a lot uh, some of these phrases in different dialects. So I usually gave, uh, gave them some cards like role play, they were not exactly authentic, but I was trying to find some uh, real characters from business uh, so that they could use this, uh, this information more authentically. Um, my students really like case studies, but uh, we had some challenges here. First of all, in my opinion, so the case studies were really packed with a lot of like we're really packed with a lot of grammar and vocabulary structures which are higher than uh, elementary level. And the first, uh, the first time was just a disaster. After I, I showed my learner the text, he was, he was panicking and saying, no, I can't do that. So that's why after that, I decided to, um, to work with case studies during three lessons. So basically the first lesson was devoted uh, only to the concept of the case study. For example, here you could see some screenshots from the first case study. It was about teleworking, that is working remotely. Um, here, uh, we basically took the first lesson. I gave him uh, a list of 20 words, a bit too much, but it was kind of a homework before the lesson. So he read them through, he learned a couple of words, and at the lesson itself, uh, uh, we spoke about the topic of teleworking. I'm mm, eliciting what he knows. We activated the schemata, his opinion about this topic. We processed the text for reading. And so in that reading, he actually saw the vocabulary, and it was kind of a text based presentation. And then we practiced the vocabulary and finished with the discussion. Uh, what his opinion about teleworking is. So basically, the first lesson was devoted completely to um, completely to the vocabulary and the concept itself, just to uh, reduce the level of stress and anxiety to be able to talk about the vocabulary, the topic, and to solve the case. And the next lesson, so if, if there were more difficulties, of course, we spent one more lesson on the on the vocabulary on on talking around the case and uh usually the last lesson was devoted to the case itself so uh my students were more ready when they came to the 
case study with the ready vocabulary, with ready structure, with the with the notion which they know. Because uh, frankly speaking, like my students uh, with forty plus, some of the concepts for them were new or um, I'd say maybe a bit uncomfortable or just unfamiliar. And that's why I had to prepare some additional information and discuss with them some points so that they could uh, feel more comfortable and they could be ready. Because psychologically, again, when they didn't know what to say or when they didn't know what the concept is, they felt really, really uncomfortable. Um, the next thing which I did was I adapted some text from the book the book has got a great variety of texts, um, both for the language, for skills, like listening, reading, like case studies. Uh, what I did was uh, I, first of all, uh, asked my learners to process any text for general understanding. No matter whether it is grammar or vocabulary, I always ask them, okay, uh, this is the text, it's going to be about car hire device. We we had a little discussion, a short discussion about the topic. Then they processed the text for general understanding, for GIST. We discussed a bit the concept, and only after that, my learners were asked to fill in the gaps. Uh, it helped my learners to be familiar, like it helped my learners actually to be more conscious learners, not just to fill in the gaps with the vocabulary with which they have learned, but to process the text for the idea, for the meaning. Um, it usually gave, uh, um, it usually, um, how to say, the understanding of the text actually helped my learners to make less mistakes with their filling the gaps exercise. Um, yes, it's here, but what happens later was quite a surprise for me because later on, my because the text is really packed with nice vocabulary, with nice structures, my learners asked me to record this text for them so that they could listen to this text and uh, not only read the text, but listen in their car, learn this, uh, learn this text or just shadow the text. And I recorded this text for my learners and he had like, if there was no recording in the book, they usually have recording for some grammar exercises or for some text. But some of the texts were without audio, and I had to re record, record this myself. They really liked this, and uh, what we did was uh, he actually, the next lesson, uh, sometimes he asked me to repeat, and the next lesson, for example, I could choose a couple of sentences, two or three, and then uh, we decoded the text into into small sentences, like it was a small dictation at the beginning of the next sentence or of the next lesson with the, with the text which he studied at home. Um, it was okay because like the student had got some Soviet uh, Union like mindset. He liked dictations and all the kind of stuff. I didn't mind because uh, like, I don't know, sir, he was quite an audio learner and he really liked a lot of audio input. So we just did what he really needed and what he really wanted. And um, we, of course, we worked a lot with videos. So there are two types of videos. They are interviews and videos like uh, video around the topic. And we also worked in different ways with the old, with video. So they were, again, a bit too difficult for my learners. Therefore, I usually pre-teach some vocabulary before we spoke about the video. We had some small discussion to scaffold them and to activate their schemata, what they know about the topic, uh, just some prediction tasks by pictures. So I prepared some activities before the video. And then, again, we had some gist task before every video so that they could process it for general understanding. Then, of course, some video, of, like some listening and watching video for details. And after that, we focused a lot on decoding skills. That is uh, when they have to listen to what the speaker says and they wrote what they have heard. Uh, one of the weakest points of my learner was listening. Apart from very strong accent, it was actually uh, he was a poor listener. And therefore, we... Um, listened and decoded what he has heard. We decode it and analyze it later. 
And um, after that, of course, it was shadowing. Or sometimes when my student was too tired for writing, we did just shadowing. When he heard what the person said, I stopped and he repeated exactly what the person said. In this way, we practice his, we develop his listening skills and we develop his um, understanding of, of his ability to separate the words, what they really meant. Like, you want to wait? Like, you want to wait. You want to wait? So, and it was really hard to grasp it at the beginning, but with practice, it became easier and easier for him. And now he can, and at least he is aware of the connected speech or some features of connected speech of linking and that kind of stuff. And now he's more relaxed, he's more comfortable. And uh, this exercise helped him a lot. I mean, the dictation and the shadowing exercise help him a lot to become a better listener. Um, speaking about the rest of the activities, they were actually pretty standard, like uh, reading activities, listening, presentation, case studies. I have just shared the ideas which were specifically um, which were specifically designed for my learners for elementary learner. I mean, for the elementary level. Um, I think uh, I, I, I have got five minutes. Um, I'm ready to answer your questions. And if you have any questions, I'm fine to answer them either now or you may get in touch by Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so a couple of questions. Uh, is it an online program? So uh, basically, um, I have got an online book. So I have bought an online book. And therefore, I have got everything online. Like Macmillan has got LMS system where you can see what your learner has done and you could see all the materials digitally. And speaking about, uh, speaking about what program I use with my learner, I mean, when I was speaking about the word sets, for example, it was just a Google Doc. So all the doc, when I work with groups, I usually have got a Google Doc for my, uh, for my learners. So we have got, I write there, all the homework, all the vocabulary from the lesson, all the home tasks and some additional links. Uh, I mean, I usually give them a variety of homework. So it can be an article, a video, and maybe some practical tasks because learners are different. And if it is not a one-to-one -one lesson, I usually give them the choice for homework. So something is very, uh, something is compulsory, something is optional. And from optional, they could also choose for their learning style, whether it is a, uh, whether it is uh, reading an article or listening to a lecture or anything else what they what they want. Mm -hmm. What if the student's level is in region of advanced? Can they use this elementary book to improve the target vocabulary? Well, mm, I would say like um, if your student is uh, advanced, so I would recommend you to take uh, in company uh, upper intermediate, but you should change. You should. The, Definitely check the level of your learner because sometimes they they can be uh, really they can be upper intermediate in general English, but their knowledge of business lexis or or just some business terms could be pretty low. That's why uh, that's why you should choose the level for your learner. So, but I normally take one level lower if if the student has got some weak points. Or if you see that the student is very ambitious and hardworking and he will be doing a lot of homework, I would rather challenge the learner and take a, just a bit higher level. Mm -hmm. Okay, which typical difficulties for students and for you? So when I teach business English, for me, the biggest challenge for me is to speak about the business concept. But I graduated from a business school, so I more or less know the specifics of the business in general. Uh, when I did some ESP courses uh, in finances and investment, it took me some time to get used to their concept. And uh, it was a win-to-win -win situation when I taught my learners the language and they taught me the concept about investment and finances in return. Um, the second difficulty in business English is that so sometimes the, it's very difficult to define uh, like sometimes they have got a very big gap 
between what they know, uh, what they know, and what they can speak. I mean, sometimes they understand people, but they can't. For example, they can't speak themselves, or sometimes they could know very specific words like from upper intermediate, but they may not know some very basic words from business English, like for example, I don't know, business environment or maybe uh, networking or some other words. That's why it's a very like it's very important to do a thorough needs analysis at the very beginning to uh, to be aware of their needs, of their strong and weak points, and of their learning assumptions. I mean, uh, their readiness to do homework, for example, or how busy they are, or what is the comfortable tempo for them, or about your way to correct mistakes. So, yeah, just just don't forget about our needs analysis. And I think the last the last question because we are running out of time. Uh, what home tasks do you usually give to your students? Uh, it actually depends on my learners. Uh, firstly, I give them the option, like they, can, they do some compulsory and optional homework, uh, if they do homework, because some of my learners are not ready to do the homework. And so he's aware that the process will be lower, the progress will be lower, but we don't do the homework. Uh, with most of the learners, I recommend something very interesting, usually from the book, because, for example, the homework from in company is really interesting. The texts are interesting; they are packed with the necessary vocabulary, structures, and grammar. Uh, if they are not uh, happy, for example, with that, I can find some extra video or an interesting article myself, just based on the learners' interests and uh, their level. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will be here in the chat for a while, so if you still have got any questions, uh, you could easily contact me, either here or just by mail or Facebook, and I will be happy to, to answer all of your questions. Okay, I wish you to get more inspiration from the conference. So, have a good day, have good students, and enjoy the teaching. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Marina. Thank you for joining us. And um, I would like to present our, the next speaker. This is Steve Taylor Knowles. Uh, Steve is the author of uh, Optimize, Laser, Open Mind, and um, the whole of the uh, Macmillan exam skills series. Uh, in his talk today, Steve um, will tell us about the writing workshops from Open Mind and um, how we can make writing more collaborative. Over to you, Steve. Hello, everybody. Um, it's great to be invited to take part in the Russia online conference again. Um, uh, I hope you're all well. Um, I expect you're all scattered throughout Russia. Um, I'm in the north of England. I'm quite near Manchester. Uh, it's very autumnal. Um, in fact, it's almost wintry. We're going into winter. It's about, about 10 degrees at the moment, but it's quite a nice bright day today for a change. Um, I'd like to talk about writing. And in particular, I want to explore this idea of using peers as a writing resource. Um, why do our students struggle with writing? I think there are a few different reasons. First of all, there's the idea of register. Often we ask students to write things in a different register from how they speak. So we might ask them, for example, to write essays, or we might ask them to write um, formal letters. And so we're asking them to use a register that they actually don't use that much every day. Um, I think the second difficulty is the demands of the format, that whether you're writing um, an email or a report or a review or an essay, you need to get everything in the right shape. You need to organize things correctly. And so I think there's certain genre format demands that, that students can find difficult. I think that also there's a sense that writing is permanent. When you speak, 
uh, as I'm doing now, we often go back, we recast what we're saying, we put it in different words, we speak in half sentences, we start again to clarify, or because we've changed our tack. Speaking is a much more um, fluid, uh, even chaotic means of communication, whereas writing is on paper, it's permanent, somebody can put a take a red pen and put a, a circle around it and say three out of 10, see me after the lesson. So I think there's a certain kind of affective uh, barrier um, when it comes to writing as well. But I think the, the, the difficulty I'd like to think about today is that um, we often ask students to write on their own. Writing is often seen as a solitary, the sun has just come out and it's shining in my eyes. Writing is often seen as a solitary activity and we ask students to do it on their own. But I want us to explore today ways in which we can um, make it more of a collaborative activity. And in particular, uh, I'm gonna be looking at a course that I wrote, Open Mind. This is a course for young adults. And I'm gonna be looking at <clears throat> a section here that we call writing workshop. And I'm gonna be looking at how you can use that to support the idea of using peers as a writing resource. Peers, of course, means the other people in the classroom apart from you, the other students. <clears throat> now, actually, we're gonna think about what we can usefully use other students for and in what combinations. So you might ask students to work in pairs. You might ask students to write, to, to work together in groups. You might work together as a whole class. And each of those has a different effect on the use of peers and what, what you can get out of it. It depends exactly what you want to focus on and what your aim is. But as we work through some examples, I'll talk about what the difference is and, and how it affects what you're doing. So I think there are three main areas that I'd like to focus on. The first is peers as a language resource. This is really the idea that two heads are better than one, that when students work together, they can pool their linguistic resources. So one of them may know some useful vocabulary, another one may know different useful vocabulary. By putting that all together, it can be greater than the sum of the parts. We'll look at how that works in practice when we work through a couple of examples. The other area that I think is key is the area of ideas. When you ask your students to write, how many times do you hear the, the, um, the excuse, I didn't have any ideas. I didn't know what to write. Now, I've said this when I've been over in Russia before, that I never want a lack of ideas to get in the way of my students learning English. I am fundamentally an English teacher and a lack of ideas should never be the barrier. So if my student comes to me and says, I didn't know what to write, I didn't have any ideas, then I think really that's a failing on my part. I need to make sure that when students are asked to do some writing, they have the ideas. And I think that using peers is a really powerful way of making sure that everybody goes away with, I, with enough ideas. The third aspect that I want to think about is responding. Now you might see this, um, you might see this referred to as peer review, or you might hear the term peer correction. I think that it can be a problematic area. And the reason for that is Students are not the ones qualified 
to correct each other's work. But that's often what they are tempted to do. And the reason is the main model they have for responding to written work is how you respond to their written work. And nine times out of 10, your responses are probably marking. You probably grade a paper. You probably underline things in green and put SP in the margin for spelling mistake. You focus on accuracy and you focus on grading, probably, most of the time. And so when students are asked to read each other's writing, that's often the model that they take and that, that I don't think they're actually equipped to do. And I think that can lead to um, either resentment because, you know, what right does this other student have to correct my work? Or it can lead to a relatively bland, yes, it's fine. So I want to look in, in um, at a couple of examples. and But bear in mind these three areas. The way Open Mind works, this is from the, uh, what I'm showing you, both examples I'm showing you are from the pre-intermediate book. Um, students do the main body of the unit. In this case, the unit is all about um, food and drink. Then they have a life skills section, uh, which I've, I've been over to Russia and talked about life skills before. Um, and then after every other unit, there's either a speaking workshop or a writing workshop. And in these workshop sections, we can look in a little more detail at the kind of writing that they've been asked to do in the main body of the student's book. So in this case, this unit uh, about food, the task in the student's book was to write a recipe. Here, I'm looking in more detail at that aspect of writing a recipe. Now, you might do the work in the student's book first and let them attempt it and then look at the writing workshop, or you might get to that pause, in, get to that place in the student's book and pause, focus on the writing workshop, and then go back to what they're doing in the main body. Um, so I'm giving students a model. It's a recipe. And I've talked before about different types of models that you can use with students. This is a jigsaw model. It's a recipe where the steps have all been mixed up and students need to recreate the recipe, put them in pairs, get them to do that analysis uh, collaboratively. And then in B, I want to focus on some of the language. So this is the first area, language. Find the verbs in the recipe. What form are they in? Well, they should find that they're in the imperative, which is what we often use for instructions. Underline the sequencing words and circle the time connectors. OK, so the way I can exploit this collaboratively is to get them to work in pairs, create the categories, sequencing words and time connectors. And once they've identified them in the recipe, I can then get them to brainstorm others that are similar. So then, for example, sequencing words, they've got next, finally, first, and then. And time connectors, they've got when and while. So I can get them to brainstorm things like after that, or um, during this, or other similar phrases. And that way, they can pool their knowledge and work collaboratively to, to create a bank of language. So that's the area of language in this context. Then I'm going to look at exercise C. Now here I've suggested putting them in pairs. Um, working pairs, think of a dish that you like or invent one, talk about the ingredients and quantities you need and the instructions and name that. So this is where you can highlight a difficult a, a, dif a difference between using students in pairs, using students in groups, and using students as a whole class. What will students do if you ask them to do this in pairs? One student will pick their favorite food, spaghetti bolognese. Another student will pick their favorite food, um, chicken curry. And they will tell each other 
how to make that food, and that's what they will then go away and write about. Now, that's fine if they know what they're doing, if they know how to cook that dish. Then here they can explore their ideas together, but essentially explore their own ideas together. If you put students in a group, you can still do it that way. You can, but it'll take longer, but you can still ask them to focus on their own individual dish. Um, but when you put students in a group, that allows you to suggest that the group chooses one dish together. Now that I think can be quite powerful because that means that now they can pool their knowledge of how you make that dish as well as pooling their language. Um, and you can ask them all to come up with one idea, the recipe for one dish, and all of them in the group write about that dish. When you do this, you could also, of course, do this task as a whole class. And that you might want to do that because you want to have um, greater input into the vocabulary that they're going to need or into or indeed into the mechanics of cooking. You know, lots of students have no idea how to cook anything. Um, so as a whole class, you work together and create one idea, which then everybody goes away and writes the recipe for. So the difference between pairs, groups, and a class is the extent to which you can either control um, the input that you have or encourage collaboration between students. So that's the, uh, that's the area of ideas. Now let me say the let me just say something about the area of responses. <clears throat> Every one of these writing workshops has um, every one of these writing workshops has a checklist. The checklist is for the students who are writing. The the aim of the checklist is to make sure that a student's piece of writing meets a certain minimum standard. So there is very little point me marking or reading or responding to a student's piece of writing if they've missed some basic steps and I just really want them to write it again. So here, for example, that I've included all the necessary ingredients, the steps are in the correct order, I used imperative verbs, I used sequencing words, if they can honestly tick all of those, then at least it meets a certain minimum standard. So that's the student themselves. What about their partner or another student responding to their writing? If they are not really equipped or qualified to respond to grammatical mistakes or spelling mistakes, I'm not a big fan of getting students to correct each other's work. So what are they qualified to respond to? They're qualified to say whether they think the piece of writing has achieved its purpose because they are now the reader. So we need to get them to focus on, does this do what it sets out to do? If it's a story, does it, does it entertain and keep you interested? If not, then in some senses it is failing as a story. Is it an essay? Does it set out the writer's opinions clearly so that you can either agree or disagree with what they're saying? That's a reader response, and they're in the perfect position to respond on that level. So here, for example, they're asked, are the steps in the recipe clear and easy to follow? In other words, could you possibly cook following this recipe? The purpose of a recipe is to enable somebody to cook a dish. And I've given them a very simple traffic light system to respond, well done, nearly look at it again, think again, ask your teacher for help. So each of these response tasks, ask them to respond in that way. Does the piece of writing achieve its purpose? This is another example from a later unit. This is about writing a product review. Um, let me just address a question that I can see in the chat box. Somebody says our students don't know, this is um, Ludmilla. Hi Ludmilla. <laughs> she says, our students don't know a lot of words to describe the recipe. How can I help them to cope with this problem? 
what I'm talking about, the um, these writing workshops, they come at the end of a unit in the student's book. So in the student's book, they have done, okay, they have done lots of uh, work through the unit on food, on different words for ingredients and adjectives to describe food. And so, so they've already had language input before I asked them to look at this writing workshop. So these are not just seen in isolation, these come at the end of a unit after they've developed um, the language they're going to need. Um, so let me just have a look at this re product review very quickly. Um, what students do is they, they read a product review and they, they, they look at the content first of all, what, what's the writer's opinion. Here in B, I want them to work together. Now this, this has two functions, this test. They are analyzing the model, which they will then use as a model for their own writing. So they're analyzing the model, but also I want input in terms of language and collocations. For example, here, positive aspects, make a recommendation. So this is where I want them to work together with language so that they, uh, so that they share their ideas and their resources. <laughs> Next time I do a webinar, remind me not to sit opposite the window. Now, I'm just going to quickly wrap up now. I think I've probably taken my, my allotted 20 minutes just about. Um, they need to choose they need to choose a, um, a product and they're going to write a review of it. Now, if you ask students to do it in pairs, what will they do? They will work together, that's all very well, but they will probably choose their own product. Let's face it, they will probably choose their smartphone or they'll choose an app on their phone. Right? Um, and then they will work through this task, thinking about the particular product, but they might struggle a little bit because when they get to things like what are the negative aspects of or problems with the product, maybe there aren't any. Maybe they're quite happy with the product. In order to get around that possible difficulty, again, if they work as a group, ask them to use their imagination and choose a product. And, you know, once you ask students to use their imagination, writing becomes a lot easier. Sometimes I think students can be a, feel a bit to rooted in what is true about themselves. You know, if the question says, where was the best place you've been on holiday? Students feel a little bit like, well, I've only been to two places on holiday and I didn't really like either of those. Why not say New York? Why not say Sydney, Australia? Nobody cares if it's true or not, right? So once students get their get freed up to use their imagination. It makes this kind of task a lot easier if you're not rooted in the real world sometimes. Um, so if they're working as a group, then maybe they're going to choose a product together and they can brainstorm, share ideas. If they're working as a whole class, then again, you can kind of, um, you can control the process a little more. You can, you can make sure that everybody has exactly the right kind of language that they're going to need. So that's the ideas generation. And again, the student themselves does a proofreading review of their own writing to make sure it meets a certain minimum standard. And then the other student is asked to respond to whether the, the text, uh, the piece of writing achieves its purpose. In this case, does the review give a good idea of the writer's opinion of the product? That's what a review is for. Does it do that? Yes or no? And then, of course, you can get the students to comment on how well it does that, in what ways does it do that? You can take that in all kinds of directions, but also if you want to, you can leave it at the relatively um, simple level of uh, this traffic light system. Okay, so I just wanted to leave you with those three simple uh, categories, really, three simple idea that we can use the peers as a writing resource in the classroom for, for language sharing, for ideas sharing, and for, um, 
for getting them to respond to uh, another student's writing. Give me one sec. <laughs> right, that's better. I've closed the blinds on the window now. Um, okay, language, ideas, and responses. Um, all right, thank you very much for listening to what I had to say today. Um, I'm sorry that the, uh, the British November sun uh, made it look a little bit strange. Uh, <laughs> right, everybody's saying that's much better. All right, good. Um, are there any specific questions that you want to ask now? I mean, um, uh, the good thing about having a name like Steve Taylor Knowles is that I'm the only one on the internet. So if you want to, if you're not already connected to me on Facebook, come along and find me there. If any particular questions occur to you, then um, if any particular questions occur to you, then come and make contact on Facebook. Um, somebody says you've got the same weather today. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for listening to me today. Um, I hope that soon I'll be able to come out to Russia and see more of you in person. Uh, but otherwise, I think I'm going to leave you now. And um, I've got a pile of work on my desk to get on with. So I'm going to leave you now. And, uh, and uh, I'm just going to say thanks for listening and uh, goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, lucky you with such a good weather. Um, now we continue our conference, and um, the next speaker, uh, Alena Samchenko, she is um, uh, the creative director of uh, Keep in Touch. This is the major uh, PLS language school in Podolsk, Moscow region. We'll talk about Kagan structure. We asked Alena to talk about it because in every teacher's book of Open Mind, uh, there is a page full, uh, faithful of uh, Kagan structure. A miracle of active engagement. So, could you please type up? Um, do you know what do you know about Kagan structure, or do you know what Kagan structure is? And so, I want to remind you, this is an article in uh, Open Mind Teachers Book. No, yes, uh, Irina knows because <laughs> Irina, Irina uh, Bardakova definitely knows about Kagan structure. No, mm -hmm. no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mostly knows. So, Alona, over to you. All right. <laughs> Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Alona, and as Natalia said, I'm a representative of the Language Club Keep in Touch, which is uh, originally from Podolsk. And uh, nowadays, we um, run uh, five schools, more than uh, 500 students uh, in overall. So. It's great uh, and I'm honored to participate in uh, today's conference and I'm grateful to Macmillan for giving me such an opportunity to share what I'm really passionate about. Um, and the idea is um, that it's quite of surprising that I know something and um, I muster in something that uh, um, not many people know yet. So um, I'm uh, going to continue. So we are um, a team of young professionals, methodologists, who try to uh, input um, and to implement the educational processes with the best world practices of combining traditional teaching and approaches, communication uh, and communicative strategies, along with gamification and cooperation learning. So, as uh, the previous speaker said, the collaboration is a part of our job as well. So, and the uh, great support that uh, Macmillan gives us is uh, like uh, the courses and uh, the um, online um, stuff. Uh, we rely on Macmillan a lot, and uh, sometimes we appear to be like genie and peaks, because we try all the new um, courses, resources, and we use it as much as possible. Um, not only uh, to achieve our 
uh, students' academic needs, but also their social needs. And that's what we are focusing on. So we are discovering new ways of managing uh, our classes um, to implement the best approaches and methodology. So um, to help them develop socially uh, and to develop so-called soft skills. So, um, as I say, uh, we try uh, to discover new things and every month we have our professional development week uh, sessions in which we um, eager to find uh, some new things to present to our staff, to teach them and uh, to start practicing it on our students. So in um, about two years ago, I um, found out that Kagan Cooperative Learning and that what struck me and I, I started implementing that in our club as well. So then it appeared to be an open mind um, and I was really um, pleased that um, it is a worldly recognized thing. So what is Kagan Cooperative Learning? So Kagan, it's uh, all about engagement. Uh, so traditional teaching um, engages some students, but not all of them, obviously. Kagan is a revolutionary approach to teaching that actively engaged many and every students. Let's look at the problems that the traditional teaching creates. Students sit in the row. Okay, something is wrong. Uh, students sit in the row. Um, the rule is no uh, talking. So the teacher presents new information or a new skill. So to engage students, the teacher asks the classic question and one student responds at a time. Sound familiar, doesn't it? So what's wrong with that? So the first problem is that we set our students against each other. So students compete to the opportunity to shine. And the competitive class is not a brain-friendly environment. So the next problem is that um, the next problem is the student being very little uh, time actively engaged. The teacher is doing most of the talking time. And when we finally do engage the student, it's one and of a time, it feels like uh, something is wrong with adult one. So it feels like um, being in a long, like uh, in a long line waiting to be uh, served. So a big percentage of the class is somewhere between mildly interested and comatose. So it's no wonder we have the academic gap and here uh, achievement academic gap here. So um, traditional. Um, teaching engages some of the class um, and there are not good results at some point. So, but Kagan engages all the students. So we, like the Kagan structures, turn the things literally. So um, instead of facing the back to the, your classmate uh, head, we turn students uh, um, around each uh, face to face. And instead of calling on one student, we can call on all the students using, using the Kagan structures. For example, time to pay or share. You're going to get the idea of what that is. Um, it's, not, it's not just the amount of engagement that matters. It also matters how... Yeah, that's all right. Thank you. Um, it also matters uh, the way we engage students. With Kagan structures, we engage uh, students with interactive pair and team structures. While the students master academic curriculum, they develop essential social skills. They learn teamwork. They develop communication skills. They practice leadership skills. So they are these are very college and career oriented skills. Our um, like students are no longer isolated or competing against each other. So they are praying to each other's uh, success. Uh, they are on the same side. And cooperation leads to the kinder and more caring kids as well. So 
Kagan structure is, isn't something we might work, but it is scientifically research-based approach. And the hundreds of studies of cooperative learning show tremendous uh, um, academic and social gains to over traditional learning. So um, it engaged, disengaged students <laughs> and it doesn't make them bored or disruptive or anything like that. So Kagan works because uh, creates the full engagement for every student. So it is engaged students, they enjoy school, they love what they do, and they learn more in that way. So Kagan works because it engages all of them. So you wonder what magic stick is that and why we haven't heard about that, how to do that. So I'm going to share some ideas with you so far. So um, how to transfer your um, traditional class into cooperative learning? If you bear this question in mind, like a statement, a good class is a quiet class. Change it. Learning involves healthy noise. Keep your eyes on the paper. No. Help your partner to solve it. Sit quietly. Never happens in our classes. So they get up. They look what others do. They look at each other's papers. So talking is cheating. No, we have to verbalize to learn, pronounce and, and to motivate them to speak and uh, kind of produce what they know. So um, Kagan is the last name of the author of uh, this uh, kind of third party product. So it's very, very um, oriented on the marketing thing. They try to sell that. But the Kagan uh, has created several books and the stores to create the teachers uh, uh, revert the, uh, their classes into cooperative classrooms. And um, his books, the first book, The Cooperative Learning by Kagan, is divided into seven so-called keys. Structures, teams, management, class building, team building, social skills and basic principles, which are pies. So today I'm going to focus only on structures because it will take me about 10 hours to explain it all. So cooperative learning structures are content-free, repeatable instruction sequences that organize the interaction of the students to implement the basic principles of cooperative learning. So what you have to remember is that they are content-free, repeatable instructions which have to be told to the students at the beginning of the year so they get used to it and you don't waste your time explaining whether you um, set that arrangement for this activity or another. Your students know how you're going to do that already. So um, here it is. Um, here is like a, an extract from the book. So I expect some of the questions where to get the book and so on. Um, pretty much we would uh, send you the link, uh, um, you can download the book. Uh, I, I'm not sure about um, the accessibility in Russia, but we're going to work it around. Um, there are free resources providing that. And the Kagan um, allows us to go abroad in US and specifically uh, to participate in their sections. Um, uh, to become a Kagan instructor, instructor for the teacher as well. So here's a list of them and different structures uh, refer to um, different um, skills. Okay? So if you want to um, achieve like social skill or you want to um, input the decision making um, structure, you choose one of them. And here is an example. So the very, very common one is stand up, hand up, pair up, uh, which is widely used, is uh, just the way to pair up your students. So it will just save you so much time. You say, stand up, hand up, pair up. Your students know what to do. You're going to see it in the example. So all the instructions are clearly written there. So. A so-called robin, uh, round robin and rally robin. It can be all right, all right consens consensus. For example, if you have a topic to discuss, you don't call on one student and uh, the others are waiting for uh, the other's response. They sit 
uh, in the circle, they have a piece of, uh, piece of, uh, piece of paper, so they write uh, their ideas down, then they rotate the papers, they, impl uh, like they add their ideas, and it circulates till uh, um, it's, it's done, and they're finding a consensus. It's kind of the organizing uh, your environment in the classroom. Um, so, simultaneous, uh, simultaneous roundtable will be shown in the video as well. Inside, outside circle. So, this is a way uh, when we do um, asking uh, questions, like when we do role plays, uh, when we do uh, find someone who, uh, when we do like uh, simple question uh, responses, we can um, put the inner and outside circle and then the students rotate and there are clear instructions for the students and the um, and for the instructor himself so um, actually that works for any uh, number of the people in the group especially if you've got the large groups in our club the uh, total amount of students is eight the maximum but we can work with two or four as well so there are different structures that can be used and you know the structures are content free so it is it might be applied for multi-age groups so it works for adults as well believe us so we have that experience so um mix freeze group this is a fun way to do the questionnaire on some facts maybe uh, instead of just writing a quiz or or something um, the students dance around the classroom or do they just simply move and uh, they mix and you say freeze. Then you ask a question, for instance, how many planets are there in our solar system? Without cheering to the peers with the, for classmates, they put the fingers like uh, on the chest and then you clap and we, sh we say show me. And they have to, um, like molecules, you know, the, gate, the Russian equivalent for that, like, they get together and the answer would be that. So, uh, and they discuss it in the teams, like oh, what planet would, would be the biggest, the smallest in that very particular team. If there is a uh, not equal uh, number of the students in the classroom, there is always the structure called lost and found. There is a special place in your classroom when someone doesn't have a, a partner um, and there is no partner left, that person goes into lost and found box and uh, um, any team can get him. This is class building, team building activity as well. Yeah. So, um, uh, we are going to um, stop. Uh, uh, okay, I'll show you one more structure. Mm. Okay, uh, spending a buck or talking cheap. So, uh, from the last um, speaker, like Dave was speaking yesterday about shy students and about um, not motivated students to speak or in, co in contrary if for example in our club we have students who are too much talkative and it's when they work in the groups they are desperate to add something but um, here it is a structure which can help you talking chips um, you can get like the chips or the money or any coins to your students and um, one amount of one cheap is uh, like the entrance ticket to the discussion. You put in and you spend it and you talk for like 20 seconds. It depends what time limitation you would set yourself. So um, 20 seconds and then we rotate and the next one has to speak. OK, so he has to put his talking cheaps. And if they have some extra, they do it uh, like uh, uh, faster and faster. So, um, it might seem, uh, I don't know, <laughs> uh, maybe not organized, uh, but when you, try, when you start doing it in your classroom, um, class after class, it really works. So, I'm going to show you the video. Um, if you don't mind, please, can we switch to the video? Uh, there are three structures presented. 
um, you might take a look uh, on the screen and the example from our teacher, one of our methodologies, Daria, she has been doing that since um, uh, since last year. So just see what her experience is that, and then we're going to discuss it. Can we start from the beginning? So, mobile phones is the thing which is very important nowadays. Do you agree with me? Yes. yes. Okay. Are you, do you have a mobile phone? Yes, I have a mobile phone. I think that it's very useful. Marsh, what about you? Mm, yes, I have uh, and uh, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Denise, do you use your mobile phone? Yes, I use it sometimes. Okay, Vlad, how often do you use it? I uh, often use it. Yeah. Okay, so, and this is the thing I want you to talk today. They are advantages and disadvantages of mobile phones. So, for that, could you please stand up and come to me? Okay, good. So, you mix, mix around the class, so you mix. Okay, you mix. Go on, go on. So, stop. Hands up and pair up. Okay, so in this way you take down your seat and continue working in pairs. So, look please at the board. Each of you is partner A or partner B. A or B, A or B. The question we need to discuss is advantages and disadvantages of using mobile phones. So, these are your worksheets. So, one of you is student A, one of you is student B. So, student A, you write one idea, so one advantage of using mobile phone. Student B, you write one idea of disadvantage. After writing only one idea, you switch your worksheets and continue until I say stop. See, got it? Do you like playing broken telephones? Yes! yes. yes. Okay, so now you know what communication breakdown could be. So, the telephone is a very important thing in our life, agree? Yes. yes. Do you use the phones at home? Of course. Yes. Of course. So, there are different types of phones and this is the thing I want you to discuss. Look please at the board. There are three questions. Vlad, can you read the first one, please? Do you have a family phone at home? Thank you. We love the second. If so, what type of phones do you use? A landline, a mobile phone? Or uh, internet. Okay, landline. Thank you. Much and the third. How often do people call their family phones? Perfect. So to discuss these three questions, so as usual, we need to make two circles, inside and outside. So you could do that. <laughs> as you wish. So if somebody's inside, okay, great, great outside. <laughs> good, good. Okay, so now touch your partners with your fingers, great. Inside circle you answer questions, outside you ask questions. When I say rotate, you rotate one, two or three ahead. When I say switch, you switch places So and you switch your circles. Ready? Yes. Start. Do you have a family phone? No, I have a family Okay, and you continue. 
Okay, then you switch. You switch. Okay, great. Touch your partners. Great, and you continue. All right. So, yeah, pretty much um, that's how it works, and um, that's the basic ideas for that. Um, the book not only tells us about the structures, I'm going to switch uh, over here. Uh, the book also tells us uh, how to organize the team of four. Uh, how uh, how to put them into pairs like uh, um, high and low medium partners and depending on the level shy and not shy students how to uh, form random teams in uh, from outside and outside circle it is all described and of course the seat team uh, um, the team sitting arrangement guidelines okay what types of the uh, settings is important so um, you would say if it works or not, if it revolutionary or not, just after you're going to um, dive deeply into that uh, and you're going to answer a lot of questions yourself. So um, how do you ensure accuracy in the answers? So we know that yeah, it works. So um, there is a free practice, but simultaneously corrections are possible as well. So it can be peer correction as well when they are responding to each other. Um, or the student um, or the teacher, uh, the mentor, is uh, capable of uh, walking around and doing it at the same time. So um, here we go. Uh, it will work in the larger groups um, if uh, you organize it well enough and if you have uh, uh, sufficient practice. Uh, the name of the book is The Kagan's uh, Cooperative Learning. So, um, as, like, uh, um, controversial question if it's much better than speaking uh, in order one by one. I don't think that they get to, to do that in real life. Uh, nowadays, uh, when we're at the uh, business meetings or even um, among the friends, no one gets to speak in order one by one. You have to have the skills of speaking simultaneously. Okay, fluency, accuracy. Okay, so um, pretty much it's what you can implement into your classroom. Um, you know, um, the word revolutionary was used to, uh, to kind of to present it and to, uh, like they use it as a hook, it's marketing um, and they sell it. So there is a not much of the free content on their website, but you can, um, but you can pretty much uh, search. Uh, thank you for your attention. Bye bye. Thank you very much, Aluna. Um, thank you for sharing us uh, the idea of Kagan structure. I want to remind you <clears throat> again that um, you can write uh, about Kagan structure, and there's um, a website in every teacher's book of open mind for every level. Um, we continue our conference, and uh, the next speaker is Vera Babkova. Uh, Vera is a practicing teacher at uh, a really Novaya school. It's a really new school, and Vera will uh, tell a few words about it. Um, she's a former British Council trainer from 2008 to uh, 2016, and she Fulbright alumna. And um, Vera will be talking about time savers for busy teachers. So, Vera, over to you. everyone uh, so to in order to check if you can see me or hear me can you type in the chat what am I holding in my hands hi so what am I holding in my hands 
All right, fantastic. That's one of the books by Macmillan Publishing. And uh, that's the book that I really love reading, uh, not as a textbook, but a uh, textbook, but as a book, because it has a lot of factual information. Um, can you guess what this is? Hi. OK, no, that's not a mobile. Square, yeah, no cards, matches, oh, lovely. Timer, no. Again, more guesses. Kind of gadget, speaker. Okay, I'll turn it this way. Hi. Our bank? No. Not a box of matches. Glister? What is glister? Uh, it's not meant as an advertisement. That's a dental floss. Uh, now, can you... Yeah, this is a dental floss that you use to brush your teeth, uh, to clean your teeth, yeah? So can you please tell what the connection between two of these things is? Type your ideas in the chat. And you know what? You can change the color of your chat. You can make it purple or pink. Theme of health or useful. OK. Any more ideas how are these two things connected? Time saving. <laughs> Okay, um, I won't torture you for long. There is no correct answer. It's just uh, an example of a technique you can use uh, to start your lesson to kind of activate uh, their thought process. Um, especially with adult learners when they come to class and they're tired and they're not concentrated. Uh, you just start with two random objects and you ask what the connection is. Uh, or you can uh, ask what the difference is and they can start with ideas, their brain starts working. So these were just like two random objects on my desk. Um, so uh, as Natalia said, I'm an active practicing teacher at Nova Escola. I used to work uh, at a learning school. Um, as you can see on the on the screen now, there is me on Facebook. You can find me, you can friend me. Uh, I post a lot of information. Um, my website is currently not working. I'm trying to solve it. Okay, louder. Okay, I try to speak louder. So moving on. So would you please type in the chat where you're from? Armenia. Part of this. Kazakhstan, St. Petersburg, Barnaul. Hello, Barnaul. Spain, wow, Kaliningrad, lovely. So I'm originally from Altai Tikrai, uh, Bisk, and I'm working in Moscow. So hi, all the regions, lovely to see you. Um, in this short session of 20 minutes, uh, we kind of started a bit late, uh, we're going to look at some activities which can help you save your time during preparation. Kalomna, I love Kalomna. So um, we'll try to talk about um, you know, vocabulary exercises, grammar exercises that will hopefully save your time and you will have time to floss your teeth, for example. Um, so that's the first one. On your screen, Archangelis, love, I've never been there. On your screen, you have a word grid. Uh, in, your, in this grid, could you please find a few words that are related to our topic? Webinar, wow. Hop, <laughs> hop was not meant, but it could be that. Okay, webinar, anything else from the webinar, apart from the webinar? Row, online, yes, yes, Yelena, online, okay. Teachers, yes, Natalia, good job. <laughs> C, C, I love C, but it's not really connected to this webinar. Okay, um, online, mad. <laughs> okay, um, I'll show you the answers. Works. Okay, here are the answers. Uh, the keywords of today is Macmillan, online sharing, teachers' time, webinar, and workshop. 
Um, as you can see, that also engages your thinking. And some years ago, I was sure that this type of exercise is some kind of fun, and this is uh, not real learning. Uh, but at our school, we have a neuropsychologist who said and explained that these types of tasks, they actually activate the brain somehow. And it really helps the learners to focus on the words and on the uh, information that you are giving after this activity. And after I started using this uh, word search, I noticed that even the weaker learners, uh, when they notice these words in the text, they get really excited and they tend to remember these words uh, much better than without this exercise. Try this magic. Um, and this uh, exact uh, word search was done with the help of Puzzle Maker. You go to Puzzle Maker and then uh, click on Word Search. Um, you can just create it. Um, yes, and I can see somebody's Ludmila 4 says she likes crosswords. Skip this one. Uh, okay, I'll talk about crosswords then. Mm, this is the website that you can use for creating crosswords. It's called crosswordlabs.com. Um, it took me five years. It usually takes me five minutes, sorry, not years, five minutes to create a crossword. Would you please type some ideas on how to create a crossword faster? So the question is, how can you make a crossword oops, faster? Sorry. No. Uh, where did the presentation go? Where did the presentation go? Yes, yes, it's here. I guess I put... Yeah, uh, special apps. Well, um, <laughs> learning apps, sometimes people say type faster. Um, and I love the idea about making students do this. Uh, yes, that's my one of my groups. And I always ask my learners to prepare a crossword. Uh, for the unit, and we have a person on duty to do that. Um, if you're working with, uh, <laughs> be imaginative, if you're working with adult learners who are very busy, that probably won't be a, the best option. But if they take turns, they actually love this responsibility and they love the idea that today it's them who is bringing the crossword to class and you know they're responsible um as for is it easy yes you just go and type the words uh, word translation word translation uh, if you can type and use word you can easily use the crossword labs and if you log in you can store all of your crosswords and if you name them easily like for example i don't know like Global Unit 1, Global Unit 2, you will be easily, uh, you will easily come back and reuse your crossword. You can add terms, you can edit it. I just really love it. Um, one more activity, sorry, which I really love and it doesn't require any preparation time. Uh, that's called Missing Letters. And uh, I always say that I'm a lazy teacher, so I ask my learners to do a lot of work for me. So especially in the beginning of uh, a lesson, when we kind of have to brush up the vocabulary, uh, I ask the learners to prepare a short task for each other. They take little pieces of paper and they can use their notebooks. Uh, they just miss the letters and then the exchange, so basically the um, procedures on the screen in front of you, and then they check each other, and that's just like a nice revision. And once they get into the routine, they can even do this before you actually start a lesson. When they start showing up for your class, and you're like, okay, do the revision, missing letters, and they know what to do. Um, 
we have can we copy it from this website um ludmila yes you can copy it you can save it from the website you can save the keys to the crossword and you can print it as well um so moving on so we've talked about crossword uh speaking of grammar so i'm kind of in a rush <laughs> so uh we've talked about some vocabulary exercises uh, now some grammar exercises uh, i couldn't miss of course uh, i could not mention this good old find someone who uh probably all know about this uh you just type something um using the target grammar structure however it's uh, again a nice strategy to ask your learners to prepare the questions for find someone who so for example you're learning um now present simple so you can ask your learners to come up with three questions so like how often do you go on holiday how often do you brush your teeth how often do not do you travel to st petersburg and they write this question it's not you but it's them and then it says your time and then it becomes a more meaningful activity for the learners um one more grammar activity which i really like is called snowball or snowball fight um, and a lot of teachers mm, say that oh wow this is like for little kids and i personally do have more experience with working with teenagers um not that much with adults uh, however adults uh, really love having fun as well and actually adding this uh, fun to their classroom really boosts the motivation and they know that they can relax and uh, kind of be silly and make mistakes and that's normal so what happens with a snowball fight uh, you focus on a certain grammar structure let's say have you ever and the students uh, write a have you ever question on the piece of paper and i'm a very environmentally friendly person i'm like crazy about the environment so i use the used paper uh, so on one part it's uh, um yeah on one part it's some, there's something written and on the other part the sheet is empty so we write on that part uh, so they write a have you ever question then we make a ball then we have a fight and then they open the page and they write the questions then you can do it again uh, the snowball fight activity really works nice with the um what's the word indirect speech so for example you write a question and then a person has to report the speech and says uh miss vera asks if i like snowboarding for example yeah that's kinesthetic and that's effective okay thank you guys for your reaction um that's another way of practicing a grammar structure uh let's go from everything to nothing uh, when you write a question or a sentence on the board and then you start deleting something and then you ask your group to re repeat the quest the sentence after you and then there is nothing on the board and they have to reconstruct the sentence from their memory um on the other hand there is another version which called from nothing to everything which we are going to try now um so when you start a sentence and then every student adds a word or two to make a sentence longer so we're going to do the following since we're here at Macmillan Conference, um, topic here is Macmillan Conference. So the sentence start is while we. So now be very <laughs> careful. If you have an A in your initials, in the chart, please type the next word to continue the sentence. So only those who have an A in your initials. For example, I'll, uh huh, were. So while we were, uh huh, dancing. Okay, now we need, while we were dancing, now we need the word three if you have a C in your initial. 
Okay. Aha, uh -huh. while we were darling, uh, marvelous. Is it for the, for the <laughs> while we were dancing marvelously? Uh, yes, I will share the presentation. I'll tell you later how to do this. While we were learning, thank you, Natalia. Uh, now, we're, next word, the final one, if you have a D in your initials. While we were learning. Okay, one last. While we were dancing, while we were learning. Well, you get the idea. And in the class, it's easier to manage uh, because you don't have while we're learning French, okay, diligently, cool, thank you, gotten the, um, so, uh, would you please tell me what time I need to finish, because I started on the wrong time, so I don't know what time I have to finish, uh, if I get this in the chat somewhere, it would be lovely, so, uh, next activity, and uh, chat, just a second, Next activity is called music story. Uh, it's when you play music and the learners have to write a story based on this type of music. And that's better to play some classical music, which doesn't have words. Um, I guess we'll skip the practice now. Um, this is really lovely. Fortunately, unfortunately, and this is something that we're going to play. Um, half of the group, when, when you're in class, you divide the group into halves. One group uh, says fortunately, the other is unfortunately. So now we're going to play. So if your first name, like my first name is Vera, so if your first name starts with a vowel, you will be the fortunately team. And if your first name starts with a consonant like mine, Vera, you'll be the unfortunately team. So we are going to have a story. So that's the start that you can see they met in an empty in an empty bar. So the Is one L probably probably I made a mistake, Natalia. Thank you. Fortunately, yes, that should be one L. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so the fortunately team says, fortunately the bar was with free drinks. Now the unfortunately it was empty. Okay, the fortunately team. Fortunately they had a good time. And now the unfortunately team. It was a cozy there. Unfortunately, <laughs> with a group of with a group of Englishmen, is it fortunately or unfortunately? I wonder. They fell in love, I guess that fortunately. They drank too much. Okay, you got the idea. And in the class that gets really tense because the learners uh, kind of get in the into the mood and they want it their way. And it's a lot of fun, really. Uh, you can also limit the number of answers, uh, or the, un the number of sentences each group gets. Um, you can just modify this task, but uh, while they, uh, they were not <laughs> married, it was too expensive. Okay, I guess you continue. So while they kind of focus on the um, fortunately, unfortunately, bit they learn first. They learn the structure. They learn the past tenses, and then they also learn to connect the sentences somehow. Okay, uh, one more activity I love to share is fridge magnet. Uh, magnets. Would you please put a plus if you have them in your apartment? Fridge magnet. Oh yeah. Are all suffer. Okay, I wonder who hasn't. Is there a person who doesn't have the fridge magnets? Unfortunately, too many of them. All right. Oh, Katerina, wow, you don't have fridge magnets. Fantastic. 
um, then you can skip the sexy styles. But usually, we I, I personally don't know what to do with them, but I love them. Uh, so these are possible ways uh, on the next slide. First thing you can do, you can bring them all to the class. They're authentic. They students can touch them, or you can ask your learners to bring their own fridge magnets, which is also a lot of fun. Then you can practice the have you ever structure with them. So like they, they pick a magnet from a, a box or from, from a bag, and they ask each other, as the previous speaker was speaking, was saying you can put them into mini groups and uh, you, can, uh, you can have them ask this question in groups or with the class then you can practice like when was the last time you were in Dublin or in Kazakhstan or and then you can have the model answers on the board so it's basically drilling but it becomes really meaningful drilling um, then when they choose uh, <laughs> no I'm not from Almaty um, I'm from Bisk but I know well the Almaty's um, then when they choose a magnet, let it be Spain, for example, they can ask about Spain, what's the capital, what's the longest river, what's the highest mountain. Uh, especially with the adult learners, they usually tend to know a lot. Um, with the teenagers, that's also a nice uh, way of showing off because there are a lot of learners who know a lot. But if they don't know, that's a nice reason to Google. Uh, I usually allow my learners to use their phones with the internet during the lessons to find out more. Um, then things like, would you like to visit Kazakhstan or Spain or Bisk? Or would you like to live? Blah, blah, blah. What do you know? Name three facts. Then you can also practice the, if I uh, went to Kazakhstan structure. So it's the second conditional. Um, a lot of things. Moving on, um, when we finish the lesson or a unit, that's a good idea to have reflection and uh, a way of reflection, which I really love, that kind of kills two birds with one stone, writing a reflection in the form of uh, exam writing. Um, for example, uh, I prepare for cat and pet a lot. Uh, so these are on, on the screen, you see some examples of the cat and pet um, tasks. So for example, your group made Kirill, uh, from your group made Kirill, it's a shame I couldn't come tonight, too much work at the office, what did you study, was it an informative lesson, why see you? Um, so they basically kind of write what they've learned, but they write it in the form uh, that you need them to practice. Or for example, after this event, you could have written a story like your colleague Masha from your colleague Masha. I'm sorry, I couldn't join you for the McMillan online conference. Did you get any cool teaching ideas? What were your favorites? Was it worth going to? Was there something you kind of disliked? Write back and let me know. This is the pet structure. And then, um, as you can see in the picture, I sometimes put them around the room so they can look. Um, and the final thing, of course, you can use ready-made lessons for your lessons and not waste time on preparing them. And a great resource is the onestopenglish.com by Macmillan. This is something that I love uh, from like years ago when I started teaching back in Bisk. And that was my resource number one. I still love it, still use it. Um, that's another resource that I love, uh, teachingenglish.org.uk. And a lot of you mentioned sharing the presentation. Uh, oh, no, more on this topic. Uh, there are some books you can find um, on these activities that does not re do not require that much time for preparation. I'm also holding holding a workshop on the 18th of November. It's in Moscow, unfortunately. You can find me on Facebook. I'll tell you more about it. And finally, how I can share the presentation. I'm going to give you a link to the group, oh sorry, not to the form, where you can leave your contact details, including your email, and I'm going to email you the presentation and a bonus. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening, I hope that was fast. Um, yeah, so 
if you please, Larissa, if you please fill in the form so that all the emails will be in one place because I um, don't think I will be able to access them from this chat soon, but in the form they will be right there. Um, one minute for the question. I'll try to look at them and answer them. Thank you, Vladislav. Have a nice day, you too. Ludmila, so again, here's the form for the emails. Thank you. An example of music story. Um, the music story. I usually have some classical um, classical works of or something from football, like this one. Oops. See if it plays. So they listen for one minute. Uh, sometimes they can draw during this uh, story, oh sorry, during this music, and then they write something which was happening uh, in their opinion. Or sometimes they say, okay guys, use modal verbs. Okay. Hokasia Bakan. Okay. Thank you guys. So I guess it's over to Natalia. One more time the link for the form to share uh, the presentation. Bye. Thank you very much, Vera. Thank you for sharing your, your materials so the teachers can download. Yeah, thank you very much. The emails and then the I will be able to send everything to them. Okay. Thank you very much for all the speakers and thank you, thank you very much uh, to you, our dear audience. So you were great. Thank you for your questions, for your active participations. Um, we are very happy that you've managed to join us today. So this is the end. This is the official end, and um, now you'll see uh, a link which will be available for you to download, uh, then to first to activate and then download your certificate. So you just um, follow the instructions which uh, we are going to show you. So the, here is the step-by-step -step instruction for you, how to activate and then download your certificate. Уважаемые коллеги, вам нужно, вы сейчас на экране видите инструкцию. Сначала нужно авторизоваться. Для этого нужно нажать на слово «вход» в правом верхнем углу, рядом со, слово, со словом «регистрация». Вы все уже зарегистрированы на сайте, раз вы сегодня подключились, и вы регистрировались на конференцию, нажав на кнопочку «Я пойду». Вам нужно только авторизоваться. Для этого вы нажимаете кнопочку «вход» в правом верхнем углу на сайте macmillan.ru авторизуетесь, и после этого вы переходите по ссылке, которую сейчас а, а, Елена вам еще раз продублирует. Те, кто сегодня принимал участие в конференции, с, используя таблиц, вы, вам будет дана короткая ссылка, которую можно просто переписать а, и, и впечатать ее. Не обязательно сертификат даже активировать именно сейчас, если у вас есть эта ссылка, вы можете это сделать позже. Уважаемые коллеги, мы с вами, пока у вас не а, получится, это очень легко, вам нужно только один раз понять, у кого-то очень много уже сертификатов, здесь среди участников мы видим а, наших постоянных слушателей, мы очень рады а, тому, что вы находите время к нам, подключаетесь, у вас сертификаты могут быть уже на второй странице, поэтому а, проверьте первую страницу, а, перешагните на вторую, и он там вас ждет для того, чтобы его скачать, неограниченное количество раз. Я же с вами прощаюсь. Еще раз вас благодарю. Вы все получите письмо от меня с записью сегодняшней конференции. Вы можете пересмотреть ее, показать ссылку коллегам, поделиться информацией. И также вы можете 
найти там полезные ресурсы, которые мы тоже сегодня, о чем сегодня говорили наши спикеры, мы тоже туда включим для вас. Я с вами прощаюсь. До новых встреч в эфире, а также на наших очных семинарах. Следите, пожалуйста, за информацией. Если вы в каких-то городах у нас тоже вывешивается информация о наших ближайших семинарах, например, 15 ноября, это будет Нижний Новгород. Если вы из Нижнего Новгорода или откуда-то поближе, тоже мы вас там ждем. Еще раз вас благодарю. Мы очень рады такому отклику, такому интересу к нашей двухдневной конференции. До новых встреч!